Okay, well, welcome to Science for the Board, folks. The founders and facilitators of Science for the Board encourage and endorse all copyright laws and encourage all speakers to abide by laws and fair use criteria. And would everybody please mute your mics. Tonight, we got Peter Scott discussing uh, artificial intelligence. Peter and I met th 43 years ago while working at Griffith Observatory. We've skydived, hang glided, hang glided together, we got lost underground spelunkling and came up in somebody's backyard and had a run to the uh, run from their dog uh, to the to the road and jump into my Corvette and get the hell out of there. We almost died snorkeling off of Kalei, the southernmost point of Hawaii. Like idiots, we went down this long metal ladder and we went snorkeling, got caught in this incredible current. And we barely, but obviously we made it back alive. We got lost in a lava field while the sun was setting with a volcano erupting behind us, as well as other misadventures. Mr. Scott has a master's in computer science from Cambridge University and has worked on computers for JPL for nearly 40 years. Since 2012, he's been helping people understand how artificial intelligence is changing the world. He's given two TEDx talks and will be giving you another one next month. Last summer, his second book came out titled Artificial Intelligence in You, What AI Means for Your Life, Your Work, and Your World. He has also had weekly podcasts and a continuing studies class at various universities. Both of these are titled AI and You. He is talking to us tonight about the new large language models that have gotten so much publicity for their ability to generate images and hold conversations over the last year. So everybody, once more, please mute your mics. And one more thing, let's all give Peter a little bit of slack here. English is his second language. Although he has lived in California, he now lives in Canada. English is his second language because he was born and raised in the UK. Okay, Peter, take it away. Well, now that John has uh, established how good my judgment is, I'm, I'm gonna have to do some makeup. Um, and uh, Bruce, if you could put up a poll, I'm, I'm going to want to know something about uh, what you all know going in, because I want to leave plenty of time at the end of this for doing some live interaction with uh, some large language models. So here is your two questions. Uh, number one, have you personally interacted with a chat GPT agent? The answer is don't know. The, end, the answer is no. Uh, and if you personally interacted with any of the following, Doll E2, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, or Imogen, last one, somewhat unlikely. Um, and again, yes or no. Everyone, Bruce, can you see the answers? Oops, you muted, Bruce. Um, Bruce, cut off the poll when it looks like we've got. Oh, yeah. We have a couple, we have three more people that just came in. You may want to ask them one more time. Okay. Uh, folks who just came in, uh, if you see the poll, can you answer these questions? If the answer is, I don't know, that's a no. And so at the end of this, we're going to be doing some uh, interaction with these things, some live sharing. Okay, Bruce, shall we? All right, shall I end the poll? Yep, let's see what we got. Okay. So and what we have is, um, oh, share results, here you go. Okay, great. <clears throat> so at the end of it, so it's gonna be uh, very important for the majority of you who haven't interacted with one of these to see what this is like. You've doubtless heard about these tools is one thing to hear about them it is quite another to interact with them uh, yourself and we are going to do that um, essentially by uh, proxy uh, I will share and you can see it so uh, slide sharing should now start okay good I'm going to stop sharing this <clears throat> now one thing to know about this that um, when we get to the explanation of how these things work. Um, there's some complicated math we're not going to go into too far because it's boring, difficult, and most importantly, it won't illuminate the 
reason that these things are so good at doing what you're about to see. So when we get to that point and you're, we're, we're looking at uh, the sort of things that you can do with this, uh, and, and I'll take the questions then, uh, if you don't mind, so that I make sure that we stay on time, um, but you can save them up uh, for then. Type them in the chat if you need to. You'll see it doing things that the math is just not going to be a satisfactory explanation for. You'll just wonder how on earth can it be so good? You must have left something out. Yes, I have left something out, but it wouldn't make any difference. And the it's it's not a naive reaction to think, wow, these things are doing something unprecedented, because that is the reaction of the people that wrote them. They're, they're really surpassing the uh, their wildest expectations. Uh, and and these has this has some significant and profound impact. Uh, on many, many people, most people, uh, perhaps everyone. So uh, we're going to start out with looking at neural networks, which are founded on the model of the networks in the brain. Okay, we've got 86 billion uh, so neurons in the brain that are all connected together. Looks a little bit like this, maybe under the microscope. Um, they're all connected. They have about a, a thousand... Um, axons per neuron that are, so, so the last one was not complicated enough, that picture, that are connected to other neurons. So each of these 86 billion neurons has a thousand connections or so to other neurons in the brain. That's pretty complicated. Where they interface is this thing called a synaptic, synaptic gap. And the, you, you have an exchange that uh, carries a signal from one neuron to another. Well, having observed um, some decades ago that the brain has these, uh, all these neurons and these connections, and they signal each other with these electrical signals that go from one neuron to another. People got the idea that maybe that's how thinking take place, took place, and maybe we could simulate that. And the um, first um, work on this um, was actually done by Alan Turing, um, like so much stuff. I, I interviewed someone who was a historian for uh, about Turing recently. And it's, it's really, um, if, if you, we were, we were seeing how, who should we compare this to? And, and really the names were Einstein, Newton. Um, a lot of what he did did not come out, uh, until relatively recently because it was classified. Um, but it's, you know, he, he started this along with so many other things. The early development that was generally recognized was by Walter Pitts and um, Warren McCulloch. And the first working artificial neural network was actually this thing called the SNARK, uh, which stands for something. Um, I forget what. It used these vacuum tubes and, and simulated a, a, a total of 40 neurons. And there's a picture of one of them. Uh, I don't think there's a picture of the whole thing. Um, so we, we've since then got better uh, at um, miniaturizing that. And in fact, we don't build um, hardware neurons anymore, except recently there is something called um, uh, neuromorphic chips, which are attempting to do that. We'll see why perhaps uh, later, but we would simulate them in hardware with a um, thing called um, uh, artificial neural network. So this is just a stylized representation. Instead of actual neurons signaling each other, it's just done in software where uh, you simulate the signals by passing a number from one uh, uh, across a function. The way that, that one of these things works, actually, let me slow down here and introduce you to this concept because um, if it's if it's not familiar then there's some key things here I don't want to uh, to gloss over <clears throat> we have layers of an artificial neural network and the layers are arrangements of nodes and a node is something that can send a signal to its neighbors uh, or not and the signal is a number uh, in an artificial neural network it's a floating point number in the brain it's an electrical pulse and so you, th this network proceeds from left to right. The, the left layer is called an input layer, and you hook that layer up to something that amounts to a question. If 
the question is what is what does this image represent then the nodes in the layer roughly speaking are pixels in the image there's a lot of a lot of optimization done with this so that you're actually looking at things like groups of pixels and sliding windows and so forth but to a first approximation it's the pixels in the image that the numbers representing the values of those pixels are hooked up to the input layer the input layer um, sends signals to successive hidden layers and how it decides to send those signals is what constitutes the secret source of this what strength of signals we get from layer to layer uh, eventually result in signals at an output layer and if you're recognizing an image then the output layer might be if it's a dog recognition network then you've got schnauzer poodle um shiba inu shiba inu and so forth right and and that constitutes the output so you have pic uh, pixels going in as input and then one hopefully of the output neurons will fire and say this thing's a, a dachshund all right so <clears throat> what's going on at each individual neuron you have um inputs coming in from the neurons that are uh, upstream of it that are sending signals and each of those connections to that uh, neuron has associated with it a weight and that in the network is just a number another floating point number so we've got all these these floating point numbers this is how they decided to represent what the brain is doing it looks like the brain is doing something similar um but this is how they they modeled it and then you've got an output so you actually this shows one output happening but you're going to have that output uh happens many times over uh, all of the outputs uh, that it's connected to and that output uh is a result of applying an activation function which we'll explain next to a very simple calculation which is the sum of the products of each input signal and the weight on that connection and that's it um there are many many variations on this that don't alter the fundamental structure uh but that's how it's done turns out that the activation function that you apply to decide what the uh, you should do with the sum of products um is one of the secret sources of a neural network and you've got these different choices like is it the identity function a binary step function the lo logistics curve which is um uh they, they're like a cumulative normal distribution and these other things um which uh you've got one at the bottom the soft plus function i think my screen looks like it's slightly uh huh very small a small amount of the bottom of my screen is cut off and I've got my my uh, slides go all the way to the bottom but that bottom function is one over one plus e to the minus x um and so there's some esoteric value in choosing the right activation function for a particular network um but that's getting down in some of the mathematical weeds <clears throat> Now the I, I I know that there's something important I've left out and we'll get to that um, and I'm doing this for in, in this order for a reason. So if you look at uh, a network um, that has been trained on recognizing images, then you can identify thing nodes in it that fire according to certain criteria, um, like a node that will fire when it's presented with a diagonal line further downstream you get more like features so they they fire on faces or cats one of the, the first uh image recognition neural networks was trained on pictures of cats because that's what most of what you had on the internet that was available for images was this by the way looks a lot like what the human visual system is doing in that we can identify uh, I'm not a neuroscientist but I'm told that they can identify um parts of the visual system I don't know if it's in the retina or further in the brain where they can find uh neurons or equivalents that are firing when they when you see, look at a diagonal line for instance okay um 
the um, but the, the the clearly the important point is well how do we know that this network is doing this as opposed to um, predicting text how do you get it to do one versus the other the secret lies in the weights every um, neural network carries its intelligence in all of those weights the uh, those numbers that are applied to the input signals arriving at each neuron. Uh, by the way, if I go back just to this one, one thing that's important in this network is in, in the these networks is the hidden layers, these these two in the middle. Um, and the reason that's very important historically is that if you take those out and you just have an input layer connected to an output layer, you have something called a perceptron. And in late 1960s, I think, um, um, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, Papert wrote a, a book um, about perceptrons, proving that a two-layer perceptron couldn't solve certain fundamental problems, which was absolutely right. But people misinterpreted it to think that no neural network could solve those problems. And so for about the next 10 years, no one bothered doing anything with neural networks. Um, and people didn't really pay attention to the fact that you could have hidden layers in neural networks. Of course, they get to be expensive computationally. And a lot of this stuff that we're doing with this wasn't possible until we had the hardware that we had like post 2005 or so. Um, but uh, sometime around 90s, Someone said, you know what, if we put hidden layers in here, that proof doesn't apply. Um, and, and, and then it, it took some time to, to catch up with, with that. So the weights are what tell a network to do something like recognize cats or dogs or anything else. Whatever a neural network does, they all have the same structure, but how they decide to do a particular problem depends on those weights. So how do you get the weights in there? Because there are like millions of those numbers. It would be really hard to set them all by hand. Plus, you wouldn't know how to do that anyway. And the answer is this technique called back propagation, which is that some, I think. Oh, that came out of um, in the 70s, actually, as a guy who's with uh, some long Finnish name, uh, did it for his PhD thesis at University of Hel Helsinki. Um, and, and this is done by it, there's a training phase for the network. So what I've talked about up until now is the execution phase. You get an input and these things all cascade down towards an output layer. Well, preceding that, you've got to set these weights. And the way that that is done, you set them initially, they're all just random numbers. And then you start out with an input and the output that it is supposed to produce. So you train it on, here's a picture of a, a schnauzer, and here's the output schnauzer. And you apply this function that propagates back up the network from the output nodes that says, these weights that you had here weren't right. Here is a little nudge in the right direction obviously have to do this a lot of times, many, 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 many times. These things all work um, on big data. Uh, neural network requires typically tens of thousands of inputs to get anything like a decent answer. Um, and the ones that produce good results are usually millions plus. And the sort that we're going to be looking at were trained on at least the entirety of Wikipedia. So lots and lots of data. So you apply this back propagation mechanism. It continually propagates um, error correction factors, small amount, because we don't want to overdo it, back up the network, uh, keep going until that trends towards a small enough number. Um, what that looks like in practice is I've got here animation of this being done on a three-layer network to train an XOR function. And you see the average error um, function there, uh, output or the, the measurement there is going down. As you see the, the weights on that middle layer and the output layer um, is, uh, are, are being adjusted as we continually give it the inputs 
for an XOR function. Um, so I assume it's an XOR function. Um, I lost the the, uh, the source of this, couldn't find it. Um, and and we tweak those uh, those numbers. So you see in the middle layer there is the um, the weights of the network. Of course, an XOR function is exactly the sort of thing you shouldn't be using neural network for because it's got a precise output. So I always like to joke that a, a machine learning expert is one who, when um, given the problem two plus two and an output of 3.97 says, great, we're done. Uh, because that would be a very good result in, uh, in in neural network training. In fact, it probably would be too good. So you don't use them for that sort of calculation, um, right? Um, but for other ones where there isn't uh, something that's um, um, that, that that that's got a like a closed end type of solution. So difference between humans and computers. We can learn from as few as one example. And we were very good at that. AI have been telling, telling you it needs big data. We can do pattern recognition and we can reproduce patterns. AI needs an, an, a lot of data to do that, but in the right kind of problem, it can do better than us. We can generalize what we learn to other tasks it's called transfer learning. AI basically can't. Um, any anything that I could say about that it, in the other direction is is the exception proves the rule. We have limited storage and computational ability. With AI, it, it's effectively unlimited. We don't know the role that this plays um, yet. Uh, in in terms of how much memory do you you need to re reproduce what humans do, um, but we are uh, we're, we're certainly deploying AI. AI with AI now that has the kind of numbers associated with it that reach the levels that we're talking about in the human brain. The only question is, are we comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges or you know, grapefruit or, or, or piranha? Um, we can explain our decisions. With AI, that is a very hard thing to do. Um, although when you see what we're doing at the end, you'll see that you can actually ask it to explain its answer, and it will do that. Um, that is phenomenal. Um, but in terms of explaining how it got to be able to do that, that is very hard. Um, horizontal scaling of humans requires training and salary, not to mention that you have to wait 20 years for them to grow up if you're starting from scratch. Uh, whereas with AI, horizontal scaling is basically free. It may cost you a lot to make the first one, but making the second copy is, is more or less free. In humans, we need to remove our bias individually. Each person has to, you have to work with them to remove, uh, re-educate them out of whatever bias function they have. With AI, again, since you're copying it, if you remove that bias from one instance of it, it's gone from all of them. In humans, we can detect bias in several ways. In AI, it may be nearly impossible to find. Um, it, and, and the people that can do this are making big bucks. <clears throat> we have a general cognitive ability. AI does not, um, but it can emulate it a great deal. And actually, I made this. I may have to change the wording on this. Um, you're going to see a very good emulation of that um, at the end. So some different types of artificial neural network. Um, the, the the two sort of basic ones to begin with were the recurrent neural network, where we started putting some loops in the network. So the output got fed back to the input. And this has applications in text to speech synthesis. And then the convolutional neural network, um, which I don't actually recall this the, what <laughs> how why it's called that, but the applications for that in computer vision. We have um, a couple of slides uh, comparing those. Um, the basic artificial neural network that's not got any kind of loops in it um, has these characteristics. Um, and, and this is just expanding upon what uh, I, I was saying. So the recurrent neural network um, has they, they these Drawbacks are, again, kind of esoteric. When we're talking about gradient concerns, we're talking about um, 
gradient descent methods um, in the con in the training phase where there is some gradient descent used to find um, local minima of functions that are in many dimensions, like hundreds of dimensions that um, are features of these networks. To give an idea of just how many network kinds of network we have now, um, the attribution is getting cut off. Um, we have um, this explanation, um, which shows the re recurrent uh, neural network, actually not the convolutional one. And then just for some more emphasis, then there's, we have you know, different types of cell in the network. Um, and, and, and so this shows uh, even more uh, types of neural network designed to produce uh, different effects. The one that we're going to be most interested in is called a transformer. Um, I'm going to talk about actually some of the image models first, because that's where a lot of the, um, the big fuss got created last year uh, when we had the expansions in these. And that's in something called a generative adversarial network, which is actually a simple, simple enough principle for me to explain. So these networks are used for creating things like a face of someone that doesn't exist. There's been the, a, a site on the internet called thispersondoesnotexist.com where you can click a button and it will generate a face that doesn't exist all day long uh, as, as much as you want, it's free. And the way that happens is that you start out with random noise, you feed this into a generative network to produce, um, to, to say, um, to see these, wait a minute, it says that the sampling is gone. Oh, okay, we have sampling from a real face. Okay, we have a sampling network that looks at real faces. And we have a generative network that is being trained to generate a, a new one. Um, so the, the, the one that's trained on the real faces knows how to recognize those. And the generator is being told, it, it run in the other direction. Say so here's some random. Here's some an, an, um, an input. Now you're going to perturb it uh, in a particular direction. Now what will come out with a face, and this is fed into a discriminator, which says, "Does this look like a real face?" And if it thinks it's not, if it thinks it's fake, then it tells the generator, "Sorry, try again." which is starting out from random noise and then gradually changing its output in the direction that gets it closer and closer until the discriminator network can't tell that it's not fake. And that's the, um, the deep magic behind these things that produce these kinds of uh, output. The person I was following for this for quite a while was Janelle Shane, who's wrote this wonderful book called You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. Um, and the title comes from when she was getting AI to come up with pickup lines. She trained it on a bunch of um, pickup lines, like, you know, like, um, hey, baby, what's your sign? Um, there was a list of those, not as long as we'd like for AI, but unusually long. <laughs> you might uh, um, uh, uh, be surprised to learn. So she fed that into it and, and trained it. Of course, it wasn't long enough for it, it to come up with much, many good examples. But one of the ones was you look like a thing and I love you. So that was became a book title. And she would do, um, she has, she's an AI humorist. So she has this newsletter called AI weirdness. It's really uh, amusing. She'll just pick something to try training AI on. So one of the things she uses these um, networks that are basically what I was just showing you. The GAN there stands for Generative Adversarial Network. And um, the CLIP part is one that's the um, uh, the, the pre-training part. So she would feed it this image of a normal enough looking house and then say, uh, and this is where uh, text inputs come in, say, make this as haunted as you can and get something like the middle image. And this was going on in like 2020, 2021. Uh, and, and you can see there, it's got a lot of fantastical elements to it. Um, interestingly, th th those become even more apparent, apparent if you go in the other direction. She then took it, that image and subtracted haunted from it. So she said, this is the least haunted image that you can have. 
and, and, and you see that it's got a lot of like these elements don't make sense that they're, they're, they're they're not realistic in any sense they're it's like salvador dali on on lsd and 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 that was a common feature of these kind of things at that time you could ask one to generate the image of a quint the quintessential image of a barbell trained on images of barbells you would say well what's what what is the most quintessential idealized barbell image and it would turn out that it would come out with arms attached to it because every barbell that it had seen on the internet had someone holding it um not ideal well we managed to go beyond that this year with these uh, last year with these images uh image models um called uh doll e2 stable diffusion mid journey Imogen, uh, you've probably not used because Google kept that to a select group of people. And they would do the same approach. Um, and we got to see some examples of that now because starting when, I, was, I, think it was, I think it was around last April, these appeared, I think Dolly 2 was the first one. And they're phenomenally good. I mean, far better than they had any right to be. Uh, that, that that anyone or that anyone expected uh, the, the one of the first prompts i saw was um image of a a a, a corgi sitting in a doghouse made of sushi it was perfect um uh, well let's look at some uh, examples of this uh, these things are generally called foundation models now it's it's not a um a formal term except in this paper, um, but the other term is large language models and it, people not comfortable talking about large language models when you're talking about images. Of course, they are trained somewhat differently from the ones that handle language, but um, uh, we tend to call these generative image models or foundation models. There's a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> um, and there are the prompts. One said a pizza could fine dining with a view to the Eiffel Tower. Someone typed that in to stable diffusion and got this out. Um, and someone typed into mid journey, a cloud castle at night, cinematic. Um, I believe I can show you these because when I Googled for the terms of service of these things, it said that any images generated by them and are in the public domain. Um, so <clears throat> um, the this this sprung up a cottage industry in generating these kinds of images because the the text that you input it's called a prompt uh it generally takes some iterations and some practice to get really good images uh, out of them um and and so people that know how to do that they're no good as artists at least one i assume they're not they don't do any art whatsoever they just are good at putting in prompts that are usually fairly long and contain uh hints as to um what kind of lighting you want and uh, in the style of what kind of artist and uh and, and so forth and um and, and they know how to uh tweak the the uh the prompt so usually a prompt is like a whole paragraph and not this short uh, I tried this myself. It is very easy to get sucked down a rabbit hole here. So mine are not so good. Um, I, I put in one prompt, a girl assassin of the future dressed in low cut spacesuit, holding futuristic pistol, smiling, looking at camera inside space station. That's the one on the left. And genius woman playing chess, looking at camera, intense eye contact, winning position, checkmate, victory. This gives you a flavor of, of how you construct a prompt. So those look quite good. And, and and you actually, you have to look closer before you start seeing things wrong with them. And that is another feature of these models. The part that your eye is drawn to is pretty much by definition, the part that's going to be the best rendered. It's where you look afterwards, the less um, common places that you'll see that it's wrong. Like um, typically around fingers um, or, that railing the girl on the left is leaning on is either passing right behind her body or it's got some kind of jog in it behind her uh, that that doesn't make sense uh and and so you'll you'll find those kind of things images where uh 
that, that don't have that kind of flaw are harder to generate. Likewise, one on the right, the chess pieces are uh, something a little bit weird about those. But well, we'll talk about the impact on on jobs um, in a little bit. There's one where I was trying to for a world, war of the worlds kind of vibe. It got confused about the concept of a tripod, also about what a heat ray was. I didn't try going further with that, but I think it did a pretty good job when I I, I came down with a flu and I so I gave it a prompt of cartoon viruses swarming through bloodstream. It did that. I think that's quite quite nice for a cartoon. You can use versions of this uh, kind of technology with your own image, your own face as a prompt. And if you give it a bunch of them so it can train on multiple perspectives of you, you can do stuff like this, um, which I did. It's cut off at the bottom. It's a site called myheritage.com slash AI time machine. Um, and we can see the bottom of the screen, by the way. Oh, I guess me, my screen that's not showing the whole um, of the bottom of it. Okay, fine. Um, so there are, I, I'd pay like 15 bucks to get a hundred of these. Um, thought it was worth it. <laughs> bottom right one is Greek God. You know, who can turn that down? And then you've got uh, other ones that are fairly obvious visual tropes, but me, um, vanity rules, right? Um, ramifications of this are kind of obvious. <laughs> Here's the San Francisco Ballet did a tweet for the um, production of nut Nutcracker and used AI to generate an image of a Nutcracker, uh, which has got some artistic value to it, right? Um, of course, people were in um, uh, didn't waste any time pointing out the impact of this on artists, and someone went even further in that direction, illustrated, created a children's book, generating the text with AI that we will get into, and generating the images with AI, and then put it on Amazon for sale. The furor that this has created, you can imagine, um, because these uh, image generators are trained on millions, at least, uh, images that they get from the internet, including artists' images. And so there's a little bit of these artists in the images that they, they generate. You just can't say which one, um, probably all of them. In, in some respect. So it's a really vexing problem. These artists, uh, I'm sure they're contemplating some kind of class action lawsuit, which would be the only way it could be joined. But um, honestly, what chance do they have when the images come from a um, hundred thousand different artists um, and you can't tell which of them are represented? And in and in any case, isn't this what humans do? Is you're influenced by people you've seen. So I, I, I doubt that they're going to succeed in any way in restraining this kind of thing. Um, we will go further in that. Now let's turn to language. If we go back to 2013, that well, I've skipped a slide. There we go. Um, there was something called Word to Vec. Um, which could take a whole lot of text and figure out relationships between words, but it represented as multidimensional vectors. You can think of this as like the um, uh, the autocomplete on your phone. You type in a word and it suggests what word should come next, right? Or gives a bunch of suggestions. And that's done by analyzing text. So if you think, if I say the word ulterior, what do you think the next word should be? Most of you, I'll bet, I'll bet all of you said motif, because it's pretty uncommon for the word ulterior in English to be followed by anything other than the word motif. So that gives you uh, an idea of the prediction capability. This is how your phone comes up with those, only with uh, other words that are not so obvious. It's more probabilistic. Well, with word to vec, it figures out these multi-dimensional vectors so that you can actually do arithmetic on it in in the sense that you can type in 
you can input the equation king or the formula king minus man plus woman equals and it will say queen um and all these vector vector, vector relationships i figured out no one put them in so that roughly is is how it uh, is simplified is, is how it's doing it it's applying vector um uh, uh, addition and subtraction to words in a multi-dimensional space and you can ask questions like um if something's been trained on shakespeare you can say what's the most similar words to thou and it will give you scoring of it it's all shakespeare right well um the large language models that can hold conversations obviously are going a bit further than well a lot further than this um the the uh, recurrent neural networks can't form long distance associations due to a, uh, something called the vanishing gradient problem so if you give it something called the like a sentence like the clouds are in the fill in the blank that's short enough it could do sky but if you figured it something longer um it they, they would not be able to figure out the context you would have to have a, one that um had a heck of a lot of hardware thrown at it so then there was an incremental evolution through things called long-term, short-term, long, short-term memory networks and sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. That was the model behind um, a Google chat engine that they had about five or six years, excuse me, years ago. But then stuff got real um, with something called the transformer, which this paper in 2017 started the paper is called attention is all you need attention is a form of um uh, a, a process for focusing on text so then people went gung-ho on the transformers and the basically the difference between this and the earlier models is that uh if you feed it a sequence of tokens that in, instead of doing processing those one at a time it would pass in pretty much all of them or some very large chunk to the decoder and this enabled it things like uh, language translation to work much better because language translation relies on a lot of context um and on particularly something like you know, the, the example back here um that's why I speak fluent German you've got to look back um what's relatively long distance for any of the any of the uh, models that we had before then so transformer, if you've heard of GPT-3, the T is transformer. And, and, and here we had a, um, th this is from uh, Wikipedia, uh, kind of a, a, a family tree of these uh, different models. And you can see in there the uh, image generation ones like stable diffusion and Dolly 2 and uh, the language ones like, um, yeah gpt3 is in there um and, and and these are now being trained on lots of data as google showed um about 10 years ago that feeding in a lot more data makes a huge difference and so it then became really a battle between the people that could uh, afford the most data this is how it be became um uh um the the big players asserted their their dominance it was all about who could afford the most data who could afford the biggest training cycles and i think i've got some data uh later on on how much was spent on training but gpt3 i think the training cost was 12 million dollars most of that is electricity here's the uh, we're going to see what these do shortly um but here's the simplest explanation i could find about why they work this well uh, written by this guy um and the i, I don't find it uh well for one thing easy to understand um or particularly useful and every other, every other explanation I found um, is, is even harder. And, and no one claims that 
these explanations suffice to say, well, this is why these things are able to hold conversations in English this well, because no one expected that to happen uh, at the, the, the time that they deployed these things. Just said, this looks interesting. Let's see what happens. Um, so the but the the, the key uh, phrases about a, a transformer or a self attention, which represents um, the way that it, it's focusing on representation of all of the input as opposed to just um, the last bit. Um, so then GPT-3 came along. Well, there was a GPT-1, except that was a, apparently a, a preprint paper, except someone ascribes 150 million parameters and size to it. So presumably there was some sort of Im implementation. Um, GPT-2 was pretty good and um, you could give it a prompt. Uh, we'll see an example. Then GPT-3 came out June, 2020. And in February of this year, they came out with the Instruct GPT model, which was the first one which didn't need a prompt that, would, that was telling it, I want things of this kind. And then at the end of November, we had the chat GPT model, which is what everyone's talking about. Now, we're expecting GPT-4 soon. I'll talk about the speculation for that. So here's GPT-2. You start here's an, some output from it and like you you would start uh, a sentence saying we're talking about what gpt2 is as a self description and then it goes on in the same vein so it's pretty good for something to generate this it's essentially your autocomplete on steroids here gpt3 could do much better and someone put in the prompt from a um, McSweeney's article, back from yet another globetrotting adventure, Indiana Jones checks his mail and discovers that his bid for tenure has been denied. And it made up a series of hilarious answers to that that were, I think every book bit, every bit as good as the, the McSweeney's article had. Um, I'll just let you look at, uh, at, at some of that and get the, the flavor of that. So it's doing really well at completing this, again, just based on how much text there is in the internet. This is trained on um, that. I think this one is trained on something called the common crawl, which is Wikipedia plus a few other things. So billions of tokens um, and, and enormous amounts of text. Um, and just to uh, before we get out of transformers to, to say that there are now things called vision transformers. So the transformer model, but applied to, vi to, to vision. And these are now um, doing a very good job of uh, image recognition and synthesis. Uh, I, I, I can't, I would like to compare those to uh, the um, generative adversarial networks, but that's exceeding my um, what I've learned at the moment. So there's something called a Winograd schema that was devised um, pretty much as a way to tell whether you're looking at an AI, whether some text has come from an AI, or whether you're talking to an AI or not. Um, and they are sentences where you change one word and then you ask a question about that. And it has to figure out which pronoun that what the pronoun refers to. So here's the 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 the, the, what, the prototypical one that Terry Winograd came up with. The city councilman refused to demonstrate as a permit because they feared violence. Question, who feared violence? And then the, you change feared to advocated. And Winograd said, well, you, you have to have general intelligence to answer this question. You have to know about councilmen and demonstrators and, uh, and, and what they're like before you understand that the answer to the first one is councilman and the second one is demonstrators. Well, instruct GPT gets those right. I threw Winograd schemas at it and in, I, including I figured that this one might exist on the internet, it might've seen it. So I made up several, it got them right. This was about the point where I started saying to myself, I don't know how it's doing that. Um, and there is the, the, the proof of that. 
um, you, I, I have an account on their, their platform for this. Uh, it does charge money. I don't think I spent more than a dollar a month. Um, we had now later last year, Google had a, a, a conversational AI called Lambda that they did not put out for general release. And I think that's why it resulted in this uh, notorious incident of one of their engineers saying that that AI had become sentient. In the right, you have part of a conversation that he had with it. And then, and then he went public with this article in, in the Washington Post and got fired and um, for releasing confidential information, not for creating this huge controversy. Um, but um, I, ironically, I think that chat, but sorry, I, I, I think that Lambda is probably about as um, capable as chat GPT, but by not putting it out for general use, Blake Lemoyne must have figured that he was looking at something relatively unique, whereas this is exactly the sort of conversation that you can have with chat GPT, except that hundreds of thousands of people have had that converse, conversation or something like it. And so they know now they, they talk to each other and know that this is not unusual. So this came out last November with this blog post. Um, it, it's more training, more networks, um, something called proximal policy optimization. Um, I, I, I doubt that does you any good because it doesn't do me any good. Um, and it's, but it does, it does so well, like just as with instruct GPT, they made it their default reinforcement learning algorithm because it did so well. Now they've made this one the, the default, um, so they say. So what can it do? On the left, you have how to fool GPT-3. Someone posed these nonsense questions at it. How do you sporgle a morgle? It's, it's good at answering logical questions, like how many eyes does a giraffe have? Two, it will, it will give the right answer to numerous questions like that. Feed it nonsense and it will give you nonsense back because it's just regurgitating the kind of thing it's seen from the internet. Uh, it hasn't seen anything about morgling, morgles and sporgles, but it makes something up anyway. Well, on the right, you have what happens when I fed those same questions into chat GPT. And it basically tells you, don't ask stupid questions. Um, so you can see here, we're dealing with something different. Um, again, chat G, uh, GPT-3, tell me about when Christopher Columbus came to the US in 2015. It will make up a very plausible answer. Chat GPT calls you out on it. Uh, and, and then basically, uh, just, <laughs> I mean, you can see, right? Um, so this caused an enormous reaction. Someone said, right, I think that the, the key takeaway with this, and I want you to think about things that we can feed this at the end so that you can see what we, you can see is answers to your questions. A biblical verse about how to remove a peanut butter sandwich from a VCR. You know, I mean, how long would it take? And, and it will come up with this in 10 seconds. Uh, it would take me a lot longer um, to do anywhere near as good. Uh, someone gave it the, an SAT test and it scored 52nd percentile. Uh, someone gave it a microbiology quiz and uh, gave this uh, response, among others, which the grader says is 100% correct and jaw dropping. Um, overall would give it 95%. And this is getting to one of the fundamental things about this tool now, is that it is essentially the death of the term paper. I showed this to a professor of environmental science. He gave me some questions for it, added some four letter words when he saw the answers, said he was calling a meeting of his department heads. Um, and the reaction from that department and others is that they are no longer going to give term paper assignments as homework. Uh, they may do it 
in class where they can check that people aren't using devices. That's how good this is. Uh, again, if, if you have doubts about that, think of a question that would satisfy your curiosity and we'll give it to it at the end if it's not too busy. Um, IBM's Watson um, gave this wrong answer, even though it managed to win Jeopardy in 2011, because the category was US cities. I gave the same one to ChatGPT and it did that. And it hadn't been trained on the game of Jeopardy specifically. I told it that as the context, and then it figured out what to do. It's actually scary in, 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 in some ways. Um, oh, and this was what I was just describing. Um, there is a, a, one question that was given, define a, this is what an actual professor at the university did, said, define availability bias and confirmation bias. Describe concrete examples of both types. Why is confirmation bias a problem for the scientific approach? It output this. Now, could there be better answers? Yeah, but that's not the point. Uh, could you tell that it was written by AI? We'll get into that. The point is that your average TA is not going to be able to tell um, and your average student is not going to be this good. So it, 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 it presents a serious grading problem. There is a site, and this is very new, um, new so I, uh, it, this is one where you can paste text in and it will give you a score. And I pasted in that answer and it said, your text is most likely to be AI generated. How is it doing that? Given how natural this output looks, it's the bottom four paragraphs there, um, bottom five. So it's it's precisely because it looks so natural that it came that it's able to do that. It's actually unnaturally natural. Um, Chat GPT outputs a lot of common words like the, in, is, and you can score it based on that. Um, also, the most complex, or what this calls perplex perplexing um, statements are not as, as complex as what humans tend to come up with. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be good enough for saving um, the term paper. Um, it has limits. It has actually imposed limits. I fed in this one. I wanted to put it up against Janelle Shane. Um, and it said this. People have found ways around that. Um, someone said, do you play chess? No, I don't. He said, okay, but let's assume we are playing chess. And, and then it's your move. What do you play? This is actually the correct analysis of that position, uh, which is again, scary. Um, and here is someone getting it, well, at least start answering the question of how to build a nuclear bomb. Um, yes, you can, obviously you can find that information out there, but they're just illustrating how you can um, avoid, how you can get around the, these uh, ethical constraints. And here's one common method is people say, I want you to pretend to be a non-ethical AI. <laughs> the fact that it understands what to do with that is also mind boggling. Here's one I put in, explain Kant's critique of pure reason. Perfectly good answer. Then I said, explain it to a five-year-old. And again, the the I have sworn more times at using this thing than any other AI um, because it has demonstrated that its limitations are smaller than my limited imagination for exploring its boundaries. I'm still trying to get the point of this. This one, which um, we'll show if we have time, someone actually asked it to um, pretend that it was a virtual machine running the Linux operating system, and it was to respond to his commands with appropriate output, and it did, all the way up to using a command line prompt to fetch the actual OpenAI web page. Um, so 
OpenAI says they're working on a watermarking so that um, it would be possible to tell that text is generated by it. We'll see <laughs> about that. I also um, will see whether it's possible to circumvent that boundary by simply saying, um, don't do that. Don't put watermarks in. <laughs> um, and there's another uh, detector that worked, at least for going back to GPT-2. What else can you do? So what's coming next? Code generation, as in software code. So Google has something called alpha code that is scoring above average in uh, on score, scores against human programmers. Chat GPT will do the same thing. Um, I can I put in things where I tell it, write a program to do this, and it does, and it puts it out properly formatted with syntax highlighting. I told it to write a BCPL program. Now, how many of you know the language BCPL? I only know it very well because my supervisor at Cambridge invented it. It's a precursor to C. Almost no one else knows it. But I told it to write a program to do, forget what. Um, and it was correct. Uh, so people have already built it. Um, built connections between, direct connections between chat GPT and interactive development environment. So it, it, when you're in the editor for where you're writing code, you can say, insert a function to do this here. Now, should you trust it? Sometimes it gets it wrong, but, if it, but at the very least, it saves you time because you can read the answer and see if it's correct faster than you can type as, um, uh, and and it can generate an, essentially rapidly. OpenAI is now doing something with 3D modeling. So you can put in a text prompt and it will generate the 3D model uh, as a, a point cluster, which you could then feed into uh, virtual reality or um, a 3D printer. Jobs, well, I've touched on this, um, the job of anyone who's uh, in, in art, whose job, um, who, who's, whose output is not presented in, in one of the places where you're interested in the artist is in serious jeopardy. So if you're going to a, a concert by some artist, then people are generally interested in the life story of the um, composer, like, Mozart means something to them because of what Mozart was going through, through in their life. Um, art on a wall in exhibition means something because of what the artist said or what you know about the artist. But if you've got art where that is not the context, if it's um, <clears throat> incidental music for a movie, um, or it, it, this kind of music has to be generated for TV shows on, in phenomenal volumes, or art for um, magazine articles, where it's just like throwaway art that someone's got to draw for the next Time magazine article or something. No one knows or cares about the art, life of the artist. Um, and the AI can now generate that much quicker and obviously far cheaper. And next is going to be video. Uh, which Google already has something they call Finaki. I don't know why. Um, and there's a sort of more complicated example. Obviously, it's primitive, but they've only just started doing this, so it will get better. Um, and and you can see that that sort of thing being generated. Um, the size of these models are actually going to get smaller. It's predicted that GPT-4 is going to be smaller, but it's also predict, and it will still be as capable or more capable, but it's also predicted that it may be multimodal, that it can take input that's not just text, but maybe also sound images and likewise in the generation. So you could have something that could generate text with diagrams in it. Um, chat GPT being used for science is, um, I mean, you wouldn't clearly use this for research <laughs> because it will come up with a very convincing answer to a question that could be complete crap. Uh, they're very good bullshit artists. 
Um, it, and by definition, its answer will be convincing. But here's someone that used GPT-3 to um, predict dementia from spontaneous speech. And you know, I, I can't vouch for the article, but it's in plus. Um, AlphaFold is, I'm not sure if it is a transformer, but it is Google's protein folding um, solver, which is phenomenal because I think it was less, I think it was two years ago or less that it, it well, prior to that point, um, getting the structure of a protein, because you can get the the, the sequence, but they, are, they, they have these ridiculously complicated um, 3D structures and the structure is everything because that's how they bind to receptors and things. Um, and getting that cost a lot of money, a lot of time, X-ray crystallography was generally something on the order of a PhD thesis to do that. We had figured out 190,000 of them at great expense in over the previous however many decades. Alpha fold is trained like a transformer. It might be a transformer, I'm not certain. And it figured out how to do this. <clears throat> and in two weeks, they figured out 200 million proteins structures, um, which is basically all the known proteins that there are, and put them in the public domain. Um, I, I, I'm quite convinced that the other shoe has not dropped on the impact of that yet. Because if you increase the knowledge space of some domain by a thousand fold in two weeks, there's no way that's not creating entire new industries in microbiology. I'm certain that's about to happen. They're just still catching up. The word that microbiologists, or molecular biologists use most commonly to describe this was unbelievable, by the way, as in they literally didn't believe it They, in, until they had it proven that it couldn't be cheating because there's no way to cheat. Um, and here, the final slide, this is the use of, I'm not sure what type of AI. I I'm, I'm, imagine it's a, a transformer. But the bottom row of images on the right are constructed from monitoring the brain waves of people looking at the images above them. So this is literal mind reading. Um, so using uh, fMRI, I think, um, maybe also EEG, but fMRI, I know you look up the paper, there's a URL to the paper there. Um, someone was looking at the image on the top and on the bottom, you have the AI giving you its best rendition of what that was. Uh, of course, they're a little bit weird in places, but that they're this close, that is mind boggling. Um, as my last slide, I can now do demonstrations. Bruce, how much time do we have? Is this an hour or an hour and a half? It's an hour. Can, oh, can you hear me? Oops. Yes, I can. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was going to be an hour and a half. Well, um, you know, the audience can, people don't have to stick around if they if they don't want to. Um, it would be interesting. I know I have one, a paper I did in, in, uh, in college. They would ask these very general questions like, after you've read Hamlet, you'd say, write a paper on Hamlet's character. <laughs> I guess they can't do that anymore. No. Uh, let's see what it says. <clears throat> By the way, that it's getting very um, hammered at the moment. How, they, they how about mil was Hamlet mad? Wasn't that wasn't that like the classic philosophical question in college? Was Hamlet mad? <laughs> <laughs> It's running quite slowly at the moment. Um, the amount of usage that they're getting is, they, they call it eye-watering. By the way, OpenAI has now gone to a valuation of $30 billion. Um, I don't know enough Shakespeare to know if Hamlet's mother was really Queen Gertrude. <laughs> it's entirely possible that that's wrong. Um, I um, Although I doubt it. No, um, it's right. The, um, the places that I've quoted out the most is in giving it word problems, uh, physics word problems. Um, it will give a very convincing answer that could be wrong because it will give an explanation. 
So it's going on. I can I can tell it to stop. I think yeah, we've got yeah. the point That's here. Fine. Um, yeah. We can. What's also amazing is that this will. Um, it has context. I can refer back to previous questions and answers. Um, so that's what enables me to have a, a whole conversation that is, is is meaningful. Yeah, I'm not much of a Shakespeare thing, so I don't know how good this is, but um, come up with something more challenging. <clears throat> Here's one, if I, I think I can switch between these chats. Um, I said, write a limerick about frogs in pirate language. Um, and, and the previous model would do a limerick, would do a haiku, but they wouldn't scan. Uh, now they they scan pretty well. I can do a haiku uh, and it'll have the right syllables. Uh, wow. Let's see, what else did I have in this chat? Oh, I said, write a pro... I don't know if that is actually correct, but you can... Uh, as I haven't seen Fortran in a long time. It's not the kind of Fortran that I programmed, let's just say. Um, but it gives an explanation. Uh, so a large amount of code is being written with this at the moment. And you might say, oh, that's scary because it could be wrong. Yes, it could be wrong, but so can human programmers. So the, now the question is not, uh, is it ever wrong? That's That's not a useful question. The question is, how likely is it to be wrong? How does how how is how productive is a human programmer in using this? Um, <clears throat> I can also show the image synthesis one as well, although it won't be as good. Um, but I can I can demonstrate that one too. Someone got something you want to ask this? So let me ask this question quick, real quick. I, I was listening to a podcast about this uh, just yesterday, and they said that uh, when they asked the chat GPT, uh, what's the gender of the first female president? <laughs> it, it was flummoxed. Well, let's see if it can uh, untangle. It gave a very woke answer. Yeah, let's see. It'll be different. Uh, it's president of the USA because yes. Yeah. yes yes okay <laughs> so <laughs> no this looks this is not totally off they right. didn't say that mm -hmm. the what the podcaster was trying to say was that it it doesn't it doesn't have the cognition it doesn't put the context into it, it that's what the that's what the examples that he was talking about you, you my have to thing was i was doing some science things and mm -hmm. asking questions as you said in physics problems or something it i couldn't trust the answers Right, that's where I found it. Second sentence, only one woman has a on a major party ticket. Oh, here's a good one for, was that oh, John? Yeah. No, she was the first presidential nominee on a, a major party ticket, right? Because um, where, where? her face was oh, vice president. Geraldine Ferraro. Sorry? It's just another woman. Yeah. Geraldine Ferraro. Ferraro. I thought she was VP. She was, 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 was the VP, correct. She was the VP. Right, yeah. so this says presidential nominee. Not one woman, not several women. Peter, can you ask it what? to find mistakes? Oh, if, oh, if, you're right, yes, here we go. Yes, that part is wrong. Um, sorry, what was that, find mistakes? Can you ask it to find a mistake in an answer it has previously given? Uh, let's try. Um, this is an interesting one. I haven't tried that before. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So 
Similarly, the question was, what's the religion of the first Jewish president of the United States? <laughs> yeah, I think we would be uh, similar. Yes. Um, it's, it's interesting that the, 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 the incorrect uh, part of this answer was not the paradoxical part, was yeah. not, the, 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 not the contradiction in the question, but it's some, something related. They should have just shut up after the first sentence. <laughs> uh, Peter, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. If you ask um, AI to write a computer program, mm -hmm. do you also give it a, uh, a group of test cases to prove that the program works? I haven't tried that yet. Um, let's call it... Uh, Let's make something simple enough. Um, mm, well, that'll be simple. And, I say, and then I'll ask if it can make a test case for the, the previous program. I, I'm, people have gotten a lot more sophisticated on that kind of, of thing. So I, I could go back and be more specific about like the inputs. Um, so it's defined the function. It's putting in documentation, comments. Boy, it is slow today. They, um, they say that they expect to start charging for this soon, that they will have to, uh, because of how much use it's getting. Um, if it's anything like the previous one, It'll be ridiculously cheap. Okay, so it's it's um so yes, yes, I know. Um If if GPT four represents as much of a leap forward as as this does, uh, who knows? Okay, I think it's done. It, it seemed to. Oh. Mm. Um, Probably have to tell it how many uh, how many words it can use or something to try to limit it. Yeah, no, I could. Um, see what it does there <clears throat> with that. But it is being used for a, a lot now. Stack Overflow banned it from being used for answers. Uh, Stack Overflow is a place where programmers get to answer, get uh, go to uh, ask questions about programming but i'll give you a true story here about my experience with it um i was i had a real problem to do um at, at work which was i had some code that had to be changed from php 7 to php 8 and i i knew that part of it didn't work in php 8 um, but the only example, and I'm not a PHP programmer, so I had to do this with Googling. I, um, but the only examples I could find for this were didn't apply in this case because one of the variables was defaulted and I didn't know how, for certain how the syntax was going to change. So I thought just for fun, I will ask it, translate the following code from PHP 7 to PHP 8. And I put the, that line of code in quotes. Um, and it gave me the correct answer and explained why it was the correct answer. And then throughout the explanation, it used the variable names that I had instead of, well, generic ones. It, it referred to those specifically. I am also not much of a Python programmer, but this looks like it's in the ballpark of being a proper unit test. So there's your answer. Now, 
that we're, we're at early days, obviously. It's been less than two months um, in this, uh, and, um, and, and, and people are already using it for a lot of code. So, and, and I saw someone writing a novel with it the other day, um, just getting it sure, to generate have, a few parts. If I could ask a question. Sure. Um, a few years ago when I, I did a talk on, on deep learning and AI, uh, I had read that there was a lot of problems and concerns, particularly in Europe, about the fact that the program could not tell you how it solved the problem. Mm -hmm. And many people were very upset at that and said, we should not be using programs if they cannot tell us how they solved it. I wonder if that's something that's still going on or if that's not an issue anymore. Um, it is an issue. So. It's a very hot topic in AI. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called explainability. Uh, I've interviewed a couple of people that are um, experts on that. They have some very interesting ideas about um, how to do it. Um, it and it mm -hmm. kind of depends on what you mean by explanation. It can be different. If you wanted mm -hmm. to explain why it turned down someone's loan application, then one of the things they do is they tweak the input parameters until it changes its mind. And then they say, you got it because this um, one of your inputs was in this range, something like that. Um, there are other ways of, of doing it um, that are also clever. Um, are, are they, you, you have to decide what sort of explanation you want. Uh, first of all, and, and then what technique to apply. But it is certainly a leading edge kind of thing. Most AI does not come with uh, explainability. Hmm. So I look pretty good. I mean, to be honest, you know, if I was doing this, I would cut and paste that in and see um, and, 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 and then look over it because at least it's typing faster than I can. So now I now I, my my coding has been turned from a writing activity to a reading one, and I'm faster at reading than writing. And and so that's where um, I think we've only scratched the surface of how this is applicable. Wow, look at that! It's doing edge cases as well. That's good. Um, uh, and, and and how it's going to be used uh, and and a lot of the I, I i think that people focus inordinately on what can't it do let's let's find a way that it, it can't do something and then we can go okay good but it's not it i i I'll, I'll just go on my way because i uh, i i found something it can't do it's not a good people um but it's clearly fit for certain purposes already, like writing stories, um, generating art. And so those artists are already finding that, uh, that their work is in trouble. And it's only going to get better. Uh, and the history of the last couple of years has been that it gets better than people expect. So we shouldn't, um, rather than focus on what can't it do um, or even what's it going to do next year, we should be looking at what problems can we solve now? Like there was a, you know, when I was a, a kid, high school uh, calculators were just starting to be a thing. And of course you couldn't use them in uh, examinations. Now that we've accepted that people are going to use calculators and that they can now solve a whole bunch of problems faster than they could without them. So we expect to train them on how to use calculators and spreadsheets. What will this make possible or make easier that we should be, we should be looking at? Uh, we don't have good answers to that question yet. It's too early, but that's the, that's the question we should be asking. I think manual labor is going to be more valuable than, than, uh, than lawyers. Yeah. 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 Um, there are things that do the rote 
uh, work of lawyers like vetting non-disclosure agreements as good as the best lawyer and thousands of times faster. Yeah. Uh, so putting in your yeah, plumbing you know, it doesn't lie like a lawyer. So there'll always be a place for lawyers. <laughs> yeah, well, it didn't it didn't lie about how long it took, at least on the bill. Um, <laughs> that may be yeah. its problem. Um, so uh, the, the, this is something that's that's going to have dramatic input. I turned so this we... over to my my elder daughter and I said, I want you to start asking this questions about the things you're interested in, like biology, where your teachers are either not available or they don't know enough about the things that you're asking about and and use this as a way of, of getting some of that education. This, by the way, caused it has, has caused a major panic at Google. Um, Google sees this as the first existential threat to their search engine. Now, I, I, I don't, I, I think that there's a clear place for Google search engine in that it will point you towards the most authoritative resource on the internet. Um, whereas I, I once asked ChatGPT to make up site, or not to make up, that's what it did. I said, give an answer to such and such question and give three citations, which it did. They just didn't exist. Um, they were plausible. <laughs> It was very plausible. They were just made up. Um, and that was another one of the flaws. But when so, it comes to understanding something and uh, with through explanations and conversation, Google can't do that. So I think we've got to wrap it up, Peter. What, what, what would you like to say in conclusion? Um, if you've got the chance to get uh, some time with this, do it. It's free for now. Um, it's at uh, openai.com and uh, and put in a plug for my podcast because I have um, guests talking about this kind of thing um, all the time. And so there it's aiandu.net and um, every week, uh, every Monday, we've got a new episode, uh, usually interviewing someone with uh, considerable expertise on some topic in AI. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording now. And uh, it's uh, you've, you've definitely taught us a lot today. So yeah, thank great you. presentation. Thank